you have your uh, Bibles out or your Bible app open on your phone, please join me in reading John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Ignore that on the screen. That's not the right scripture. The next day, there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, that's not our problem, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. But his mother told the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine. But you have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. How many of you tended to a a wedding recently. Hopefully everything went well. How I many of you remember your own weddings? Meeting with uh, the pastor maybe during the rehearsal the day before or maybe just minutes prior to the wedding itself. You know, maybe the pastor may have said, okay, if something goes wrong, don't panic. You know, maybe maybe uh, one of the bridesmaids breaks a heel. Maybe the uh, ring bearer or the flower girl gets shy and nervous all of a sudden and refuses to walk down the aisle. Uh, maybe the ice sculpture in the reception area is melting too fast or breaks, you know, something like that. Don't worry, you know, everything will be all right. Well, something went wrong at this wedding that Jesus attended. They ran out of wine, which was a very big deal in this culture. Weddings were huge community events that lasted several days and involved countless details. There was always at least a year between the engagement and the wedding itself. The party was a sign of faith in God and the connection of God between God's people. People came together in celebration. People celebrated love, community, and of course, God. Now Mary had a special place at this wedding feast. Perhaps she had helped with the arrangement somehow, because we know she had authority over the servants. Some Christian scholars speculate that she may have been a sister to the bridegroom's mother. Take note, there's no mention of Joseph here. Chances are he had already passed away long ago before this. Now, for a Jewish feast, wine was critically important. Now, it was not for you know, getting drunk, having a good time. In fact, drunkenness was considered a huge disgrace. I mean, I don't think we all agree drunkenness is considered grace now publicly, but especially then. In fact, back then, they actually drank a concoction that was, some believed to be two parts wine and three parts water, because the wine could be so strong, either in alcohol con content or in flavor, that it needed to be diluted with the water. Now, in this celebration, in this small, poor village, scholars aren't 100% agree where Cana was located, although most agree that it was located just outside of Nazareth. In fact, it was said that if you stood on the tallest building in Nazareth and looked out on the horizon, you could see the outskirts of Cana from there. Why did they run out of wine, though? Perhaps it was just one of those things they didn't plan well enough. Maybe they had uh, a lot of, a lot more guests than they anticipated. You know, maybe, maybe everybody brought a plus one with them to their uh, ceremony. Perhaps there was one or two people who just uh, indulged a little too much with the wine. You've been to a celebration, there's like some guest, or maybe it's a, a family get-together, 
there's always somebody, there's always that awkward uncle or that awkward aunt who just enjoys themselves a little too much. Uncle Charlie is three sheets to the wind again. It's not even 7 o'clock and Aunt Angie's already killed a bottle of Pinot all by herself. Most likely, though, the couple was poor and they just simply didn't have enough. They just gathered together as much as they could, but it wasn't enough. But unfortunately, to run out of wine was considered a sign of disrespect, of not trusting that you'd be taken care of. You could be shunned, ostracized from the community, and you could even be sued. Could you imagine starting off a marriage that way, embarrassed, broke, and facing a lawsuit? Now Mary notices they've run out of wine. And Jesus, you know, kind of sounds harsh. What is that to you and me? You know, so my time hasn't yet come. Mary kind of pushes him to take care of it. Anyway, it's the time of their need. You do something. Then Mary says some of the wisest words ever uttered. She tells the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. She kind of pushes Jesus into his first miracle. You might be able to see him kind of there just rolling his eyes, kind of sighing. And it shows the humanness of Jesus. He even had his mother telling him what to do, even though he was 30 years old at the time. And she was right, and he acted. He acted. It's just, and it's a human moment that reminds us that Jesus identifies fully with us as humans. Yeah, I, Amelia and I have, uh, in our home, we have quite the zoo of animals. We have four cats, a dog, uh, two rabbits, and two mice. For me, and it's okay, but except for once a week, Amelia reminds me that we have to, the rabbits, by the way, are for the kids, but come on. Amelia reminds me that we have to clean out the rabbit cage, and I hate cleaning out the rabbit cage. I'm always like, no, I don't want to do it, and I really do it. I whine. I, I kind of stop my feet. She's like, honey, that's not attractive. Let's just Let's just get it done. Let's get it over with. Can you imagine Jesus is kind of like this? He's like, no, my time hasn't come. And Mary's like, no, you do it. There's going to be things in this world that God wants you to do that at first you're not going to want to do. Steve just preached about that in his series on Jonah. But from time to time, you're going to need a little push to get going in the direction that you need to go. Have you ever had someone like Mary in your life, someone who has given you that little push? Someone who says to you, go do it. You do it. Sometimes it's someone who's just blunt. Yes, you're going to church Sunday. I'm picking you up at 8.30. Yeah, you're going to open up your checkbook and give $100 to the mission trip, even though I know you're hoping to get away with just 5 or 10. I know that I wouldn't have accomplished much in my life if there hadn't been someone in the background encouraging me to move forward, even when I didn't want to. We all need someone like Mary, a Mary who will encourage us, someone who sees where we need to be and gets a little pushy with us to get us out of our comfort zone. Do you have someone like Mary? If you do, maybe now's the time to start listening to that person instead of shutting them out. On the other hand, maybe you were supposed to be a Mary for someone else. Maybe there's someone close to you and you sense their call to be faithful to God in some area of their life. Go ahead. Get a little more assertive with them. They might roll their eyes. They might sigh. They might even ignore you at first. But they may also start down a path that leads to blessing. And it occurs to me, we're all disciples here, and it occurs to me that part of a disciple's job is to sometimes give that push when needed sometimes for somebody to do something to glorify God. So Jesus tell, told the stewards to fill the six stones, jars, 20 to 30 gallons each, fill them with water. Now we're told these jars are for the Jewish rites of purification. People would come to these events and ritualistically wash their feet and their hands, signifying a cleansing for God. Now it was also a practical sense as well. I mean, the footwear back then wasn't that protective. People accumulating dirt, debris on their feet when they're walking and they're traveling. If it had been raining, they're gonna be, their feet are going to be muddy. And, of course, their hands, you know, not just for handling the food, but you're going to be shaking hands, you know, hugging, touching people on shoulders. So the practical aspect of cleaning your feet and your hands is, is important. So you get ritually and literally pure, and then you can come to the party. 
So Jesus told the stewards to fill these jars. And this is when the water turns to wine. Jesus has said, it is not what is on the outside that is impure, but it is what on the inside. And now the wine, the blessing, gets on the inside and cleanses us. And the wine from Jesus that cleanses us from the inside hits our taste buds every Sunday when we take in communion. We're reminded of the cleansing, the healing, the blessing power of Jesus for our lives. Now in the story, like I've said, wine was critically important, not because of the alcohol content, but because it was a symbol of blessing. The God who provides abundance of this world, the abundance of the grapes that produce the wine that is looking out over us. To say that they had run out of wine was like a symbol, it was like they had run out of benediction, run out of blessing. It is at that moment that Jesus provides not just wine, but a blessing. Now, have you run out of wine in a relationship that is important to you? Have you run out of wine in your dreams? Just feel like you're going through the motions? Feeling like you're the one who is poor or embarrassed? Maybe you should follow Mary's advice. Do what Jesus tells you to do. Sometimes we get into trouble in the different areas of our lives. We run out of wine because we have not followed the way of Jesus in the world. We have not been obedient to his will. The gospel of sharing, the gospel of forgiving each other, the gospel of serving others. Study the scriptures. Engage yourself in prayer. And find people who can help push you into greater faithfulness. So many times people act as if God is stingy with blessings. They get into this deficit kind of thinking that you only get a little from God and God will quickly take it away. We think, maybe I can't go to God now because I've used up all the grace God's going to give. Or I don't want to blow it and have God give me a blessing now because it's something I may really need more later on. I'll just wait and cash in my chips with the Almighty when I'm really in trouble. It's like we're, we're treating God like a genie. Oh, I've already used two of my wishes. Got to save that third one for when I really, really, really need it. But no need on earth can exhaust the grace of Jesus. It's gloriously abundant. The water and the wine is a sign that God doesn't act that way. He doesn't act like a genie. God is the God of abundance and will give you what you need. He's not stingy with a little bit of blessing. He pours it out by the bucket full. We see here he turned up to 180 gallons of water into wine. Not just an eyedropper full, but an ever-flowing amount. Even if the guests at the feast hadn't already drunk all the previous stash of wine, they wouldn't, no way would they have been able to go through that full 180 gallons. Not even if Uncle Charlie or Aunt Angie were present. This is the first miracle of Jesus. And it's just a foretaste of everything that follows from Jesus. He is the one who gives us blessings and has an abundance of love and grace for us to get through whatever we face, no matter what it is. Do you believe God can do a new thing in your life? The church is the community through which God wants us to do new things. But he needs us to respond and sometimes do things that we really don't want to do. The story reminds us that no matter how bad it is, if we keep filling our jars, Jesus turns that water into wine. Now, there are times when we may sense a delay on Jesus' part to help with real-life problems, as if we need to tug on Jesus' sleeve and say, Hey, we've run out of money. We've run out of hope. We've run out of chances. Our relationship's in trouble. There are people without food, without shelter, who are being denied basic human rights. When we hear these things, it makes us ask the classic question, what would Jesus do? Y'all remember those WWJD bracelets that were real popular 20, 25 years ago? What would Jesus do? Would Jesus would perform a miracle. We can't do that. We aren't Jesus. But we can do what he tells us to do, to be faithful, to be hopeful, to be charitable, to seek justice, and to do the small acts of kindness that are available to us every single day. 
The servants do what they are told, no questions asked. And amazing things begin to happen. Miracles happen. The world changes from that point forward. Jesus can turn our weeping into laughter, our sorrow into unspeakable joy, our fears and failures into a witness of transforming power, our cries of anguish into shouts of praise. His first miracle was not in front of a large crowd. It was in a home of a humble family. He used his power to save a new, newly married couple from humiliation. It is such deeds of understanding and simple kindness that we too can show that we are followers of Jesus Christ. Jesus always brings the good stuff. Some people have this idea of Jesus in his ministry that he you know, was almost emotionless, very quiet, almost stoic. Although now that I say that, I don't know that stoicism and Christianity really go hand in hand. But Jesus never considered being happy in inappropriate behavior. He made 180 gallons of wine for a feast when they'd already gone through their previous stash. Jesus knows how to celebrate the joys of life. Sometimes it's going to take a lot of trips to the well to get those jars full, but we must keep going. Keep filling your jars and see what blessings come. Now, you may have to keep filling your jars for days, weeks, months, even years. But eventually, those jars of water will be turned into wine. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we know that your blessings are abundant. Sometimes we forget that when we face troubles. Something unexpected happens. Help us to remember that no matter what we face, your blessings are abundant. Even if they don't come at a time of our choosing, we know they come at your timing, because your timing is perfect. And your blessings are limitless. Thank you, Lord. Amen.